Hi, welcome to the latest episode of the Visa Hour. Today, we're going to discuss how you can prepare for your immigrant visa interview. To join, you can submit your questions by posting them on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag the visa hour, or by posting them on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash manila.usembassy, or on our Google Plus page, google.com slash plus US Embassy Manila. My name's Kevin. I'm one of the vice consuls here in the immigrant visa unit at US Embassy Manila. Um, I may or may not be the person doing your interview on the day that you come to the embassy. I uh, just want to let everyone know I'm very happy today. Yesterday was opening day in the United States for Major League Baseball. So it's, uh, it's a happy time for me. And I'm Daniel. I'm also working in the consular section. And I also might be the person that comes to do your interview, uh, to interview you when you come on your interview day. I'm a little excited about opening day for baseball as well. But unlike Kevin, my baseball team, the Los Angeles Dodgers, stand a better chance this year. Before we get started with the questions, we wanted to talk for a moment about what to expect on your interview day. Um, please be aware that the way that we schedule appointment times has changed for um, immigrant VCs at uh, US Embassy Manila. Um, we now use a slotted appointment time, so um, please come no earlier than 15 minutes before your interview, the scheduled interview time. Um, if you come earlier than that, you're not going to get in sooner. You won't get interviewed faster. Honestly, what happens is you have to wait outside longer. Um, also, please be on time. If you come after your interview time, you're going to have to wait until 9.30 to be admitted. Um, when you enter the compound, please be aware that you're going to have to go through security. So you're going to have to go through a medical metal detector. They're going to ask if you have cell phones. And if you do, you won't be able to bring them in. There is nowhere for you to store a cell phone, so you would have to find someone you trust to hold it with you, so it's probably better to just leave it at home. Um, there are five steps once you're admitted into the embassy for uh, moving through the immigrant visa process. Um, steps four, uh, three and four, are, you'll be talking with an officer. Um, and then the final step is step five, where you'll be released from the embassy. Uh, one of the most important things you can do to expedite the receipt of your visa, uh, to hurry up how you get your visa, is to register your address with um, our service provider, GSS. And you can do that with the website or by calling the service center. Um, and, and register the address where you want your, your visa to go. Um, if you come to the interview and you get issued a visa and we don't have an address to send the visa to, you can't get your visa. It's a little bit like winning the lottery and then not going in to cash in your ticket. So it's very important to make sure that you register your delivery address. And then one last thing. Uh, we've been hearing from some um, visa recipients that there's some confusion. Your visa packet will look something like this. Um, it's a manila envelope with your name and biographical information stapled to the front. And then it's inside a plastic envelope. And there's some confusion based on the letter uh, that if the envelope is open, that you won't be able to enter the United States easily. Let me just clarify. The plastic envelope is there for your convenience. If you got caught in the rain or something like that, it's to protect the paperwork. If you open it, that is fine. Um, the manila envelope that is inside that contains a bunch of paperwork needs to remain sealed and stamped by the embassy. If you were to open that manila envelope, the paper envelope inside, you'd have to come back to the embassy and have it resealed. We also want to talk for just a second about the interview itself. Now you're in the embassy, you've waited for a little while, and it's your turn up at the window. And so some of the things that we want you to consider before you actually get there uh, is about coming prepared. Now we recognize that this is kind of a complex process and you've gone through a lot of steps, but there's a couple of things that you can keep in mind early that will make your day of interview a whole lot easier. During the interview, we're going to ask you questions about your petitioner and your relationship with your petitioner. So you should come ready to answer um, some of those basic questions. We're also going to want to see some of, your, some of your documents, so it's important to make sure that they're in order as well. One of the most important things we can tell you today is uh, to, keep your, to make sure that your DS-260 is completed fully. Just so everyone knows, the, the DS-260 is the online application that you fill out about your travel history and your biographical information. It's the thing you complete online. If for some reason your DS-260 isn't completed on the day of your interview, that could cause big problems and possibly could make you wait even longer or come back another day. So please, 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 before you come for your day of interview, make sure that your DS-260 is completed fully. 
also, we're going to want to see some other documents. Now, you might want to know exactly which documents are necessary, and in that case, go to the website because we have lists of all the documents that are necessary to bring. When you come with these documents, make sure that they're official NSO copies of the documents and that they're still valid. Um, the dates on them will be really important, so make sure that if you bring them, they still have dates of val validity on them. We're also going to ask as part of the, the petition and application process that you show affidavit of support information. Now, this will be somebody in the United States, your petitioner, and possibly other people as well who pledge to support you financially should it be necessary when you're in the United States. Now, these forms also can be complex and definitely take some attention. Um, but each of the forms come with detailed instructions. So paying attention to the instructions will help you walk through and fill these out completely. Sometimes we see these affidavit of support documents come back with out original signatures, meaning your petitioner in the United States signed them and then maybe scanned them and emailed them to you. Or for some other reason, just sent you a picture of them and the, the original signatures are not on the documents that you sent. This is going to be a problem and it's going to cause delays. So on your affidavit of support documentation, make sure that the signatures are original written in ink signed by your petitioner or the joint sponsor. Also, as part of the affidavit of support, you're going to need to have the, the petitioner or the joint sponsor show some financial information uh, about their current situation. Now, these documents could include their most recent tax return or possibly W-2 forms from their place of employment. But if we don't have these documents to go along with the affidavit of support forms, it's also going to cause delays. So before you come for your interview, make sure that you have both pieces. Also, NBI AKAs. This is something important for us to discuss. As part of the packet of documents, you're going to need to have a clearance from NBI. Now, the clearance will be based on the name that you submit, but it happens sometimes that maybe there was an error on your birth certificate, or maybe you've, you've used a different name previously, or maybe you just got married and now you use an additional name. In all these cases, it's going to be important to have an NBI clearance for each and every one of those names. Um, you can have it based on your on your name that you currently use, that's your legal name, but also given as an AKA for any other names that you've possibly used in the past. doesn't matter how long you use those names, though, right, Dan? That's correct. So perhaps it's the first time you took a look, a close look at your birth certificate, and you found out that uh, for whatever reason, NSO recorded your first name incorrectly. Uh, we're going to ask that you provide an AKA on your NBI that uses that incorrect spelling. It sounds a little backwards, but we just want to make sure that everything is matching. Even if it's just maybe one letter off, it might seem like a small deal, but according to law, it's something that we need to follow and it'll happen every time. So make sure you come with your NBIs, including AKAs. Also, I wanted to talk just quickly about CINEMARS, Certificates of No Marriage. These are going to be an important part of your document packet for any visas that rely on a marriage or an eligibility to marry. So those would be something like fiancé visas, right? Yep. K-1s. Fiancé visas. Or um, also they're important for situations where you need to be not married. So if you're an unmarried son or daughter of an American citizen or an LPR, the CENAMAR is something we look to to ensure that you are, in fact, not married. And some people may say, well, it's my husband that's petitioning for me. I am married, so I don't need to bring a CENAMAR. However, a CENAMAR gives additional information about any previous marriages that might have taken place before your current marriage. And in that case, it's important to bring a CINEMAR even though you've already submitted a marriage certificate. Even if the CINEMAR says you've never been married except to your current husband or your current wife, that's okay. That gives us the information we need to properly make a decision on your case and move your case forward. And one final point, if you are accompanying a minor, make sure you bring some identification. Sometimes the, the applicant is a child, maybe a 10-year-old boy who's being petitioned by his mother who's in the United States and you're the aunt or the grandmother who takes care of the child. If you're coming to accompany the child, make sure you bring your driver's license or another form of photo ID in order to help facilitate the process that day. Another important point is to answer the questions clearly. Um, sometimes when you get to the interview window, finally, you've been waiting for this day for a long time and there's a lot riding on this day and so you might get a little bit nervous. And Kevin and I just want to share that you don't need to be nervous at your interview. We understand you might be. It's, it's really important, and in some cases you're really excited. 
Uh, this might mean you're going to live with a, a loved one that you haven't seen in a while. Um, but, but it's important that you not be nervous and, and not think that the consular officer is trying to trick you. No, the consular officer is not trying to trick you, is not trying to stop you. But according to law, the consular officer really needs to get to the truth and the basic facts about the case. In that sense, they will ask you questions. And it's important to answer honestly and directly with all of your answers. There may be something in your past that you're a little bit embarrassed about or not particularly proud of, or there may actually be a problem that needs to be discussed. It's always going to be a better idea to bring that information up in the front and to be clear and honest about it and help the consular officer understand your situation completely so you can work through whatever problems there might be there. I think it's also important to mention that uh, because the consular officer is obligated to find out about the relationship, and these relationships are personal, right? They're your husband or your wife or your brother or your sister or maybe your child. Um, we're going to ask you questions about that personal relationship, and it can feel strange or awkward to talk about that with someone you've never met through the glass while a bunch of other people are standing behind you. Please be aware the consular officer has no personal interest in getting that information from you. Um, you might think it's awkward to respond. Most of the consular officers think it's awkward to ask you those questions, but we're required to, and that's our job. It is our job. And, and keep in mind that everybody in that line behind you is in the exact same position that you are. When it comes their turn to give their interview, they're also going to be asked some questions that are going to be a little bit per personal. But working together, um, we can get through the process and it can be a relatively smooth experience. Now, one last point. If you come accompanying somebody else, you may be accompanying a, an elderly parent or a young child or maybe somebody that doesn't speak English particularly well. Keep in mind that we do have interpreters for various languages here that can help uh, the applicant and the officer understand one another. But even so, it's important that the applicant themselves answer the questions. Um, the officer will direct any questions that they need to to the accompanying person if necessary, but the huge majority of the questions are going to go directly to the applicant. Okay. Now, there's one more thing I want to talk about this specific episode. Um, we're not going to be able to directly answer questions about specific cases. We'll be able to give you general answers that will apply to your question, but that will also help others in a similar situation. If you have questions about your specific case, like wanting an update on its progress or status, please feel free to send an email to ivmanilareplies at state.gov. Okay, let's get down to the questions. First, we've got a question from Facebook. It's from Priscilla Reyes, and she says, I am being petitioned by my sister, who is a U.S. citizen for 20 years now. My category is F4, and my priority date is 2002. I forgot the complete date. I am now a widow for four years. Can you help me for a rough estimate of when I can have a visa interview? Okay, Priscilla, thanks for the question. Um, on an F4, let's just check the chart, I believe. So this chart, uh, we use the uh, the visa chart, and it talks about what are called priority dates, and it's available generally to the public on travel.state.gov. What was that website? Travel.state.gov. Okay. And for Priscilla, she's looking for an F4. So Priscilla, the F4 for here in the Philippines is September 1st of 1992. So there's a bit of a wait until your case comes current. But it's important to to get a hold of the visa bulletin on travel.state.gov and watch it because the cases progress at different intervals depending on the numbers that we get from the United States Congress. So it's important to check back often on the visa bulletin so you can have an idea of when your uh, priority date is coming current. We had a question from Claybo Fields who asks, I would like to get an immigrant visa for my wife and stepson. How long is the process? Must I do a request for both my wife and stepson? Do you have a chart step-by-step -step, to show the process? Once it's approved, what is the timeline that my family must arrive in the U.S.? Claybo, thanks for the question. It's a really good question. It's also, uh, if there's many parts to it. Um, first, it's important to understand that the State Department handles only one part of the immigrant visa process. We handle the part here at the embassy about the interview. The actual petition itself is filed with the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service, USCIS. If you go to travel.state.gov, our website, there's information about how to start the immigration process, and there's actually a pretty viewer-friendly kind of flowchart of how things happen and what, you, what steps you need to take. Um, with respect
we're back. I think we're back. We're good. Can you hear us? Is there audio? We... All right. So we're back. Sorry about that. A little, uh, little technical difficulty. That happens from time to time. Uh, so we're answering a question from Jenny Saria on Facebook. And she says, I'm interested to apply for an immigrant visa. What is the first step and what preparations do I need to take? Um, so the first step for most of our immigrant visas is that you have a family member in the United States who is petitioning for you. Um, and then after that, we'd encourage you to check out our website, travel.state.gov. And you can see um, the different types of visas that are available based on your family in the United States. And then that family member would have to petition for you. Um, you don't actually self-apply for an immigrant visa. Now, we keep coming back to this website, travel.state.gov, because it really has a wealth of information. That's probably the best place to stop or to start when you want to find out information about any immigrant visa category or qualifications or even just the process. Uh, the Department of State has put a lot of effort into building that website and filling it full of information, um, charts and figures and numbers and everything that is necessary in order to be prepared for an immigrant visa. Uh, we have another question. This one comes from Alexander. Alexander, he asks, my wife and daughter uh, are my derivatives and myself, uh, I am the principal applicant under a category F4, which is the brother or sister of an American citizen with a priority date of July 13th, 1988. Uh, our application was approved in the year 2010, and because of the priority date retrogression, my daughter and myself were not able to leave for America uh, until July 2012. My wife is to follow at a later date. We've now decided that my wife is to join us here in America. The question is, does she still need to submit another affidavit of support? Um, because Mr. Alexander had already provided that to NVC sometime during 2010. So he asks, can another person file the affidavit support on her behalf because her sister has already retired? Alexander, great question. Um, I think you can see how complicated uh, immigrant visa law can get. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, your, your petitioner will still need to file an affidavit of support even if she's making absolutely no money. And then you can get something called a joint sponsor who can demonstrate that she can offer financial support in the event that your family needs it. Now, one important thing to consider here is that even if your the affidavit support, even if your petitioner does not make any money and is going to require a joint sponsor, uh, the affidavit of support or the, the petitioner still can provide either tax records or if they have not filed income tax, they can provide a letter explaining why it is that they didn't file income tax and that will then go in the file as well. Okay, another question, this one from Victoria Gajo, and she asks, my family would like to apply for a tourist visa, not an immigrant visa. My friend told me not to apply for a tourist visa because the U.S. Embassy is very strict. Which documents should my family bring to our interview? Okay, Victoria, this isn't especially an immigrant visa question, um, but I can say that uh, there are a lot of tourist visas that are issued out of U.S. Embassy Manila. Um, a lot of people do get do get tourist visas to visit the United States or in some cases work in the United States. And the U.S. Embassy isn't any more strict than any other embassy in the world. Um, they apply the law evenly. There are some qualifications that need to happen before a person can get a visa to travel to the United States. Um, but again, the information necessary for the non-immigrant visas, the different categories and classifications, and even which documents should be brought into an interview for a non-immigrant visa are available on the embassy's website and also travel.state.gov. And also, Victoria, don't worry, we're going to come back in another episode of the Visa Hour to talk specifically about non-immigrant visas, so your question will likely be answered then. Vivian Gungab asks, what is the easiest way to apply for an immigrant visa or K fiance visa and what are the requirements? So Vivian, I'm sure you're going to be slightly disturbed by this answer, but uh, really do check out travel.state.gov. All the details for exactly the kinds of paperwork you would need are there. Um, and similar to uh, a previous question where it was asked how you apply for an immigrant visa, please be aware you don't apply for yourself. 
your spouse or your fiance who is the US citizen needs to apply for you. Um, and they need to file a petition with USCIS. Okay. Aim Nita from Facebook says, I would like to ask about K-1 fiancé visa requirements regarding police clearances abroad. Since I was a domestic helper in four countries, 2001 in Singapore, 2003 in Hong Kong, 2007 in Taiwan, and 2013 in Cyprus, I lived more than six months in these countries I mentioned. I do still need to get police clearance in Singapore and Hong Kong, even if I was there more than 10 years ago. I am in Negros now and will apply for K-1 visa pretty soon. Thank you and God bless. Well, thank you, AIM. Uh, the answer to your question is yes. For fiancés, if you have lived and worked abroad for six months, you need to provide a police clearance from that country. For other types of visas, it's you'll need a police clearance if you've lived or worked abroad for one year or more. So in your specific case, um, you would need a police clearance from each of those countries that you listed, but you can get more information about exactly how to get those police clearances from our website, travel.state.gov. Uh, our next question is from Saeed Savadi. He asks, I'm an Iranian who works officially and legally in the IT industry in Philippines as a web developer for five years. I'm in this industry for about 13 years, and I'd love to know any possible close choice to migrate to the US as a skilled worker. It would be highly appreciated if you can help me out with my dream job to utilize my skills. Sait, thanks for uh, thanks for the question. Um, just off the top of my head, the the category of visa that most closely applies to what you've described is an H one B. Um, that's an employment based visa. That's actually a non immigrant visa, um, and I think we're going to be addressing those in an upcoming episode. Is that right? Yeah. Dan? Judging on mo on the number of questions we're getting about H one Bs, if you're following along and you have questions specifically about H-1Bs, hang on, we're going to organize a episode related specifically to visa-based non-immigrant visas. So we will get to your questions and we'll be able to answer all of them. Okay, let's go to the next one. Yana Lu Maling from Facebook asks, are the travel visa company and travel agency company the same? and based only in the US. Also, after the travel visa company processes all my documents, is it true that the original copies will be sent to the home address on the second copy and the second copy to your office? Okay, Yana, I'm assuming you mean you're, you're talking about a non-immigrant visa um, because they're not travel agencies that really work with the immigrant visa application process. But Kevin, maybe you could talk just a little bit about how the documents get to us uh, at the interview window. Sure. Um, so first, your uh, your petitioner in the case of an Emma in the case of an IV application, your petitioner has to submit documents along with the petition that they file to USCIS, and that's in the United States. Uh, USCIS recently changed their policy. Please, please do not send them original documents. You send them copies. Um, and then you bring your original documents with you to the interview. Um, and the consular officer will ask to see them. Actually, our local staff who are doing the intake when you first get there and they're taking your fingerprints and scanning your photo, uh, they will ask for the documents. And then it all comes to the consular officer in a file. And we have all the documents along with your petition. And then actually, um, once you get your visa, it, all those original documents go into the visa packet like this. And it gets handed to. Uh, Customs and Immigration at the Port of Entry in the United States. Um, I would also just add, uh, whether you're applying for an NIV or an IV, um, you don't need to use a travel agent or a travel visa company. Check out travel.state.gov and then um, work with GSS, which is the licensed contractor with the consular section. And let me just make one more reminder about documents that you bring to your immigrant visa interview. It's important that these are NSO registered documents. Sometimes at the window, we'll get a document that's only registered with the, the civil registrar. And while these documents are, are fantastic for giving us information that's important, unfortunately, we will not be able to use them unless they are registered with NSO. So make sure that your documents you bring are uh, NSO registered documents with valid validity dates um, still intact. Uh, also, just on documents, make sure they're real documents. Uh, the consular officers see a lot of NSO registered documents all day, every day. 
So where we know when the documents uh, are not from the NSO. And it's really important, just in speaking about um, non-original documents or fraudulent documents, the consequences for providing falsified information and false documents to the consular officer can be very se severe. And we understand that sometimes um, there's weights involved with getting original registered NSO documents or maybe a correction made to a document. But please, please, it's, it's far easier for you, especially in the long run, um, if you bring only um, valid NSO documents and, and stay completely away from, from false documents or um, documents you purchased anywhere but NSO. All right, we have uh, another question from Renz Gutierrez. Uh, he says, sir, I'm applying to work in the USA. I want to ask how much I have to pay to process my visa because I have a friend there in the US and he has hired me to be his personal driver. He is working as a soldier in the US Army. Renz, thanks for your question. Um, I can't actually tell you how much you would have to pay because I'm a little bit confused about the visa class you would be applying for. Um, if you go to our website, travel.state.gov, it lays out very clearly based on the visa class that you're applying for exactly how much you have to pay uh, to whom and the dollar amount. This is really one of the greatest reasons that we keep talking about travel.state.gov because instead of trying to remember or write down all the the fees and the steps and processes, it's all there for you on travel.state.gov. So please go there and check it out and it will help you get oriented for your process. Okay, next question from Jack Saramosing. And on Facebook, he asks us, how much do I need to pay for working visa? I have a relative there who wants me to work in his company and he's the one who provides me the expenses. Okay, this, this question sounds a lot like our last one. And in speaking specifically about immigrant visas, a lot of the working visas that we see in the immigrant visa section are based specifically on uh, a skill set, an established skill set like nursing. Um, or physical therapy. Or physical therapy. And these will come through a petitioning company. Um, once again, the best source of information about specifics to your case is travel.state.gov. You can go in and look at exactly the work that you're interested in doing, the skill set that you have, and what your options are at that point uh, from an immigrant visa standpoint. Please make sure uh, in your case you fill out all the documents correctly because you're going to be employed by a family member. There are specific disclosures that need to be made if you're petitioning. Um, okay, we have another question from my Anarna Lagaspi who asks, um, I have a Filipino father living in Guam who's an American citizen by naturalization. He naturalized when I was 12 years old. I already filed at the U.S. Embassy here in the Philippines regarding adult derivative citizenship claim, but they said I'm not qualified, but I can pursue my citizenship if my father files a petition for me. It is a long time process and I'm still unmarried. Is there any possible way to shorten the process or how can I acquire citizenship through my father? Uh, my great question. Um, as it sounds like you found out, uh, acquisition of citizenship and the law behind that um, is, is really complicated. Uh, in your case, it sounds like you might be able to file for um, an F3 visa, which is an unmarried son or daughter of a US citizen. Um, that's the good news. Your father can petition for you, and he complete complete the documents and file it with USCIS. The bad news is that there's not a way to shorten that process. Um, you have to file legally and then wait for your priority date to become current. Okay, here's one from Giselle Mingo. Is it possible to get a visa for working in the U.S. as a nanny? Okay, great question, Giselle. Actually, there are a lot of nannies that go to the United States to work. Um, in most cases, nannies going to the United States will go under a, a non-immigrant visa, sometimes a B-1 visa and sometimes a J visa, but specifically for a nanny, that's probably the most likely scenario in which uh, you would you would be able to go to the United States to work as a nanny. Now that's another topic that we will cover when we have our future episode about non-immigrant visas here on the Visa Hour. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Michael Jitarake, and he asks uh, how to get a fiance visa, how long it'll take to process it, and what are the possible questions that may be asked during the interview? Um, great question. Uh, with respect to what kind of questions will be asked, Again, it's going to be the, the same kind of questions for any other family-based or relationship-based visa uh, where we ask, where we ask you know, about that relationship. How did, you, how did you meet your partner? 
what what is the nature of your relationship and then information that shows that you guys have an ongoing relationship and that you do in fact intend to get married which is the purpose of a fiance visa um, with respect to how long it takes uh, it varies on a case-by-case -case basis based on how documentarily qualified people are and um, whether or not the petition is submitted to USCIS in a complete form. Uh, generally, a petition takes about six months to get from USCIS to us here in Manila. And that's assuming that everything's gone smoothly and all the documents were submitted correctly. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, now, because we had some technical difficulty a little bit earlier, I want to go back and answer some of the questions that we answered initially. So if you're hearing this for the second time, we're sorry about that. But just in case you didn't, we want to go over a couple of them again. Um, specifically, I want to go back to Trixie Ramos's question. She asked, what are the possible questions for an F2B visa? If you fail the interview, are you given another chance? And as we pointed out to Trixie a little earlier, you can't actually fail an interview. Um, that's not really the way the interviews work. When you come to the window and the officer begins the interview, he's going to ask you questions about your petitioner. He's going to ask you questions about your relationship to the petitioner and how that relationship has been maintained over the, the life of the relationship. These are questions that you're going to know the answer to. If you're being petitioned by your mother, we're going to ask you about your mother and about your communication with your mother. These are things that you know and you'll be able to answer clearly. Nobody in the interview process is trying to trick you or trip you up. Um, I just, I just add one of the questions we often ask is where your uh, petitioner lives. Uh, we're not looking for the street address. <laughs> we get that a lot. Folks give us the, the actual street address, maybe down to the apartment number where their loved one lives. Uh, the city and state is fine. I'll be honest, I'm a little impressed sometimes that people remember the zip codes because I have a hard time remembering my own zip code. Um, but Kevin's right. Really, if you can tell us the city and state, that's going to give us a good idea where we need to go from there. But Trixie, don't be, I know it's easier to say, than to do, but you don't need to be nervous for your interview. Um, the officer is not going to try to fail you in an interview. It just doesn't happen that way. We're just interested in getting information about your relationship and about your petitioner in an honest and forthright way. When you come, please make sure that you do answer your questions clearly. Um, answer as much information as you can. If the officer needs more or less, he'll ask, but just be prepared to ask to speak candidly about your relationship to the petitioner. One last thing, Trixie, if uh, we need more information, if the interviewing officer needs more information that you can't provide, maybe uh, they're looking for photos or remittance documents or something like that that you don't have with you, that's okay. Uh, the officer will just ask you to submit them after the fact, and this might slow down the issuance of your visa, but, it, but it's not a fail. It just means we need more information. And in most cases, that's going to mean you can send these documents to us through the mail. So you don't need to come back to the embassy and you don't need to wait in line again. Um, you'll be able to just send them to us. Once we get the information, we can review the case and the new information about your petitioner and help your case move along. Uh, another, another question we're just going to uh, repeat because of some technical difficulties. Uh, Alice Sitikon on Facebook had asked, how long until the USCIS will reply to the denied K-1 visa? The petitioner is not capable of giving an affidavit of support, but he was an SSI pensioner, and his brother is the one who will give the affidavit of support to the beneficiary. Is there any problem about this? Um, so as, uh, as Dan has previously mentioned, uh, all petitioners need to have a, an affidavit of support. Specifically with a, a, K, a K1, you, you can't have a joint sponsor, so we need to see that you and your, uh, your petitioner or maybe you're not the beneficiary. The petitioner and the beneficiary together will be able to meet 125% of the poverty guidelines. Um, you can find out some more information about the poverty guidelines and how that applies to um, specific states you're going to on our website, travel.state.gov. Okay, so we've got some more questions coming in. Uh, this one's from Facebook and is from Veronica Cortez. It's kind of a long one, so let me read through this one. Hi. Just want to know how long is a petition from my son, who is an American citizen, to be processed or called for interview and final approval? I'm planning to go to Europe, U.S., to by fall to attend film festivals as a filmmaker. Congratulations, Veronica. Should I'm jealous. I, <laughs> yeah. Should I be here when they called me for interview, assuming I'd be in Europe? Also, I'd never returned to the U.S. in 28 years. What are required from me? Since petitioner is only 27 years old, can we present additional financial support from my parents, both U.S. citizens? 
Okay, let's pause there for a second and, and dive into that one a bit. Um, Kevin, what can you tell us about the interview process? If she's called for an interview and she's not around, how can she schedule an interview date to make sure that it's convenient for her as well? So if you, uh, there's two ways that interviews get scheduled, right? First, uh, the way a petition starts, it starts with USCIS, uh, that's the US Customs and Immigration Service, and then it gets sent to the National Visa Center and it waits at the National Visa Center until your priority date is current. And then when your priority date is current, the National Visa Center sends out a paper letter to uh, your, uh, your petitioner and to the beneficiary that says, hey, this is the date and time of your interview. Uh, please come. If you can't come at that time, then you just need to follow up with uh, the embassy, IV Manila replies at state.gov and say, hey, I missed my interview. What do I need to do to reschedule another one? They'll direct you to our call center, and you'll be able to choose a new interview date and time. Excellent. And to answer your question about the finan additional financial support, um, we talked a little bit before about joint sponsors, and that's what it sounds like you're interested in here. If your son, who's only 27 years old, may not be making enough to qualify for the requirements as a, a sponsor, you can get a joint sponsor, and yes, they can be your parents who are both U.S. citizens. Keep in mind that they'll need to fill out the appropriate forms. They'll need to have original signatures on those forms, and they'll need to provide some financial documents that demonstrate their financial position. Okay, let's get to the second part of your question. Also, can a U.S. citizen's sibling petition for his 16-year-old brother? What will be required? What's the procedure to follow and visa fees? Or should the mother, who is under petition, eventually petition for the 16-year-old when the former gets her immigrant status? which we don't know how long that takes, what's the best, easiest route? Kevin, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so kind of a complicated question, right? There's a, there's a lot of variables there. Um, first, uh, yes, the, um, an American citizen can file a petition for his brother or sister, uh, his or her brother or sister. Uh, that, is a, that is a long wait, as we saw from earlier in the, the visa hour. Uh, right now, the priority date is at... Uh, the 1st of September, 1992. So petitions that were filed on the 1st of September, 1992 or earlier are current. So in the situation you've described, probably the best bet is to wait until uh, you emigrate, ma'am, and you get your LPR status, and then you would file for your son. Okay, let's just catch up. Trixie Ramos has a follow-up question, and she asks, do we need to bring the original documents of the affidavit of support, such as ITR? Uh, income tax return. Uh, Trixie, the, the original documents, the forms that are filled out and signed by the sponsor and or joint sponsors does need to be original. It does have to have the original ink from the pen that the sponsor signed. However, the income tax returns can be printed out and mailed or emailed and then printed out and brought in. It's just the information that we need to see about the financial status of the sponsor or joint sponsor. Uh, Dan, I just add to that, uh, folks, just make sure you, you take a look at the affidavit of support and figure out which affidavit of support is getting filled out. Um, specifically, uh, an I-864-EZ, which is one of the forms, funnily named, but one of the forms, specifically requires that a W-2 be attached. So if you come with an 864-EZ, even if your petitioner makes a million dollars, we can't approve that affidavit of support unless you also have a W-2. That's a really good point. And let's just go back and say that when you look at these forms, sometimes they can seem a little daunting. They can be confusing, but uh, great lengths have been gone to to provide excellent instructions on each of the forms. So while it might take a little bit longer, it's going to save you time in the long run if you read through the information and the, the instructions on each of the forms, and they'll explain clearly how to fill out the form completely so you don't have delays later on in your process. Uh, we have another question from Facebook from uh, Don Sanchez who says, my preference category is F2A with priority date December 7, 2015. I just want to ask, how long do I still have to wait uh, for my visa? Um, so again, we, uh, Mr. Sanchez, we'd encourage you to check out travel.state.gov. That's where all the priority dates are listed uh, on the visa bulletin. And that visa bulletin and those dates change on a month by month basis. Um, in, in your case right now, the priority date for an F2A is uh, 22 October of 2014, so October 22nd of 2014. 
Um, so you haven't yet made it to your priority date. Uh, I'm sure you've waited for a while. Unfortunately, we have no way of predicting um, what the May numbers look like. Uh, that is based on the total number of visas allotted by Congress. Um, so uh, just stay tuned on travel.state.gov. And as soon as your, um, your priority date is current, you'll be contacted about an interview. Okay, we have a very similar question from Alan Ledsma Filoteo on Facebook. He's asking about an F1 um, visa, but essentially the answer is exactly the same. Alan, uh, the, tra the visa bulletin on travel.state.gov is going to be your best information. And like Kevin said, it changes all the time, so make sure that you check back often, and that will give you a really good idea about how your case is progressing along and when your current your case is going to become current. Uh, we have another question from uh, Gabrielle Zuri Rain, who says, uh, "My son, 28, is a U.S. citizen and should file to petition me, uh, and should file to petition for me. However, he had heart surgery in 2013. Oh, I'm sorry to sorry to hear that, Miss Gabrielle. Uh, sadly, I was not even there at all. Uh, I need to see him due to his health situation. He lives with my 80 year old father, who is also weak. I plan to go to the U.S. in a couple months to see my son, as mentioned, because of his health situation." Can he file a petition in the U.S. when I get there? What type of visa should I apply for to get approved as I'm leaving for the health reasons? Thank you. So, Gabrielle, uh, first, thanks for your question. And then, again, sorry to hear about your, your son's health. Uh, I hope he's able to recover. Um, I can't tell from your question if you already have an NIV visa. If you do, I just remind you, um, your NIV visa is not to uh, allow you to stay in the United States permanently, right? Um, and overstaying an NIV visa can uh, have a negative impact on your ability to obtain an immigrant visa. Sounds like you could potentially qualify for two different types of visa, right? One filed by your son or one filed by your father. Um, I'd check out travel.state.gov and um, see which visa makes the most sense for you. Good stuff. Okay, Flor Uranus Kaberic online says, I wish to have a US visa. I already have a Korean visa. My dream is to see the USA. Funny you should mention that, Floor. Our dream is for you to receive the USA as well. Um, the best thing for you to do if you plan to go and travel is to get and qualify for a non-immigrant visa. Um, if you plan to immigrate for the, to the United States to stay permanently, like Kevin's mentioned before, that's going to be a completely different process that requires uh, a relative or petitioning um, or somebody with a petitionable relationship to petition for you to come and live permanently. If you'd like to just see the great United States of America, and we hope that you're able to at some point, a travel uh, non-immigrant visa will let you do that. But hang on, our next uh, immigrant or our next visa hour is going to deal specifically with non-immigrant visas, and we'll be able to answer more questions and give you more information then. Dan, since you mentioned it, I do think it's important to mention though that the United States and U.S. Embassy Manila wants people to go to the United States. We want you to be able to go and visit the United States if that's what you want to do. Please know there's not a numerical limitation on the number of NIVs that are issued. We issue as many people who are qualified that apply as apply. It's true. It's never been easier for well-qualified travelers to go and visit the United States. The Philippines and the United States have a, a long-standing and very special relationship. And it's important to, to facilitate this legitimate travel between the Philippines and the United States. So um, hang on for that next episode of the Visa Hour, and we'll talk a lot more about uh, non-immigrant visas. Uh, thanks to Rizalita Huler for her comments on Facebook. She says we've given her some great information. I hope the rest of you feel the same. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer all your questions. Uh, you may post them and any visa questions on the visa wall of our Facebook page at on.fb.me slash visa wall. For your Im immigrant visa inquiries, send us an email at ivmanilareplies at state.gov. And of course, don't forget to visit our visa blog, visa, v Satisfied Voyager at blogs.usembassy.gov slash Philippines. Nailed it. Uh, we want to thank everyone who sent their questions. Priscilla, Clayboy, Trixie, Alice, Cameron, Jenny, Alexander, Alexander, Victoria, Vivian, Aim, Saeed, Yana, Rents, Jack, May, Giselle, Michael, Veronica, Don, Alan, Alice, Gabrielle, Flor, and of course, Rizalita. Thank you all so very much. You can watch the on-demand version of this episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash US Embassy Manila. 
Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash manila.usembassy and follow us on Twitter as well, at US Embassy Manila. Add us to your circles on Google Plus at google.com slash plus US Embassy Manila. And check us out on Instagram at US Embassy Manila. Again, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you next month for the next episode of the Visa Hour. And watch baseball. Dodgers. Bye. Bye-bye.